out of voluntary associations and have existed for well over a hundred years and only since 1956 has the federal government been involved in setting standards for accreditation. Another key element that I think has made higher education in the U.S. significant is the independence of governing boards uh, to chart the future of institutions and to ensure the integrity of the institution. Not all countries have such governing boards. Clearly, academic freedom to produce high quality research in, and, and increasingly and research has borne this out, the most significant factor for social mobility in the United States has proved to be further education, tertiary education. And that has been a major motivator to expand higher education in terms of earning, satisfaction, participation in civic life. It's also true uh, that um, High quality education is an engine for economic development. I live right outside Silicon Valley in California, and one only has to, you know, I'm sure everyone has heard how the development of Silicon Valley has brought iPhones, everything that um, we now live with in technology. And so seeing higher a quality higher education system is very important to the country. In the United States, there are many different types of institutions and therefore standards, as we have developed them, need to be applied adaptively. We have one set of standards across all institutions, but they would be applied to a Harvard, a Berkeley, a Stanford, as well as to a community college. And so, as you see from this list, uh, you have uh, clear world-class research universities. Comprehensive universities, so uh, let's just say Harvard and Berkeley, 90% uh, or more than that of their students are full-time, uh, mainly in the day, uh, go to school during the day. At a place like San Francisco State, 28,000 students, Many will go at night, part-time, very different kind of student population. Liberal arts colleges are typically undergraduate focus on the liberal arts and not career preparation. We have many faith-based, whether it's Catholic, Protestant, uh, WASP just accredited. Dr. Desult was on the peer review team, the first liberal arts Muslim university in Berkeley, California. And then we have specialized institutions, uh, conservatories of music, art, dance, schools of design, schools only focus on engineering, and community colleges. So in any system, there are going to be great variations uh, to serve the needs of the country and to serve the diverse student populations. So let me just give the scale, which I'll describe why it has led to differentiated accreditation. Over 7,800 accredited degree institutions, over 3,000 of which are accredited by regional accrediting bodies, which one of which I headed for many years. 25 million students and over 15 institutional accreditors. 60 programmatic accreditors, over 21,000 accredited programs, 8,500 decisions annually spread across all these. So it's a quite a scale of operation. What has happened in the United States in the last 25 years, and I see this emerging in many countries, is that fewer and fewer students go to highly selective institutions full time and live on campus or near the campus. In the United States, that is now only 7% who go to Harvard, Yale, Princeton. 93% are part-time, attend close to home, uh, work 20 hours a week, have family responsibilities. Those students present tremendous challenge because they stop, they start, they drop out, they come back, and they're very different types of students from the traditional student who goes to an elite university. 
The average age has increased. The average age at San Francisco State is 28, no longer 21. In the United States, highly selective institutions remain even selective and in fact are even more selective. But comprehensive universities that serve many students, for example, I worked with the California State University system, 23 campuses, 460,000 students, is bimodal. Many students highly qualified and many students very underprepared. Uh, and 65% of students in that system, which is a very good system, 65% need remedial work in math and or in English language. Uh, California, Hawaii, New York are non-ethnic majority states, so there's tremendous diversity within the American higher education system, including an increasing number of first-generation students. In fact, the largest element or population of the growth of higher education in the United States in the last 20 years has been from underprivileged and first-generation college students. As a result of the change in the student body, completion rates vary dramatically, and we have to take that into account. The completion rate of Harvard and Stanford is 96% in four and a half years. The completion rate of San Francisco State, which is only 15 miles away, is 52% after six years, and it's not much higher after eight years about 62 percent. So we have to know that there are different kinds of students who will stop, start, and sometimes it may take eight, ten years, not four or five, to complete their degrees. And we have to take that into account in a definition of quality, at least in the United States, that the idea of completing within four years only applies to a certain category of students. Now, in the United States and in other countries, institutional accreditation is the foundation of the quality assurance system in the U.S. It is what students and parents look to. It's what the federal government looks to. It has been voluntary, except for the fact that a student cannot get financial aid for, from the federal government or from any state without accredit uh, being accredited by a federal recognized agency. And we went through a process uh, of recognition. And just last month, I was appointed to the national board that will review all accrediting agencies in the United States. But to give you a sense of the scale, $150 billion flows as a result of that accreditation. So the government is very concerned if we're going to give that kind of money to public and private institutions. We want to assure quality of the whole institution, not just individual programs. Should also say over the last 20 years, the definition of quality has changed quite dramatically and this is reflected in law adopted by Congress. We are, as a head of an accrediting agency, we were obligated to have standards at least in 10 areas. Mission, admissions, financial sustainability. Congress moved to number one, what they called success with respect to student achievement or the achievement of student learning outcomes at any institution. So the idea of quality, of selectivity, of resources, reputation still exists, but we have shifted an accrediting agencies to an outcomes-based model that focuses on completion and improving learning, particularly for the majority students of students who are the new, what used to be non-traditional, the new traditional student. There are six regional accrediting bodies and I headed up the Western Association, California, Hawaii, and the Pacific, which had over a million students. 
as you'll see in this chart, there's both a non-governmental uh, uh, recognition process called CHIA, Council on Higher Education Accreditation, and USDE is the United States Department of Education. Each have a process of reviewing accrediting agencies to make sure they meet quality standards and are effective in serving the public. There are seven regional, four faith-related, um, career-related, as you can see, and 62 programmatic. Uh, the regionals are the ones that um, accredit most of the, nearly all the main main institutions in the U.S. What is the value, I believe, of institutional accreditation? It focuses on the whole institution, not just limited parts. And seeing the data that only 5.7 percent of careers are accredited would mean uh, basically uh, 94 percent, 94.3 percent, right? of career programs are not accredited. So the question would be, do they function, do these unaccredited career programs function within a quality university process or system? It also looks at institutional finances. In working with presidents in the United States and in other countries, one of their the greatest values of career accreditation is it acknowledges the quality of a particular discipline or career in business, law, medicine. But the greatest challenge that the president of the university submits is that each career, each career evaluation demands more resources. So the parts are being, the parts that are evaluated get more resources than the parts that aren't being evaluated. And the presidents need to balance where those resources should go. So focusing on institutional finances, critically important. It also provides an opportunity to look at remedial education, preparation of students, and one of the biggest issues is strategic planning of the whole institution and aligning financial allocations, academic planning with the institutional direction. Uh, we would require that an institution have a five to seven year strategic plan. Where is it going? How will it get there? What are the academic programs? And is it going to allocate the resources to achieve that? The, another thing that institutional accreditation does is it brings people together from different parts of the institution that might not otherwise work together. One of the greatest things about doing an institutional self-study is that people learn from one another. So for example, what's going on in the School of Engineering and the School of Medicine, there may be much that can be learned from one another that comes about from an institution-wide cross-disciplinary process. Uh, if I may tell a quick story, uh, we had the president of Harvard, the former president of Harvard, Derek Bach, chair the team to the University of Southern California. And President Bach was meeting in a small conference room with the department chairs of about 20 different departments at the University of Southern California. It's a premier research university. And he challenged them, he said, why do you still have departments? Why do you still have disciplines when there isn't a single problem that your graduates are going to face that is limited to a single discipline? What are you doing to promote cross-disciplinary thinking, research, um, problem-solving, engagement? And of course, the department chairs gave all the answers. We're preparing them for graduate school. This is enables to do research. It enables to develop a way of thinking as a sociologist, as an anthropologist, as a social worker. Uh, but President Bach said the future is not around single disciplines. The future is around solving the world's problems. And so one of the things that institutional accreditation can do is challenge 
how do we build cross-disciplinary projects? Because that's not easy to do. How do we support them? And how do we support innovation? Finally, one of the other things that we have learned at WASC is that institutions are often what we would call data-free zones. There is a tremendous amount of data sitting in different offices of the university, but not collected in a way that is strategic or being used to improve quality across the whole institution. And so one of the greatest impacts as we moved our accrediting process to an outcomes-based, evidence-based process was the creation of offices of institutional research that worked with every department to gather appropriate data and to disseminate the data, but to aggregate the data. We called it building a culture of evidence to support improvement and decision making. Russell Acoff, who is the father of systems thinking in the United States, uh, gave a talk once I sat in and he said, if you had a car with, that brought together the parts of the best cars in the world, so you had a, a steering system from a Beamer, Mercedes suspension, an engine from Toyota that will never die, brakes from Lexus, interior, well, let's say Rolls-Royce, a Ford sound system. Would the car work? No, because none of the systems are integrated. And that was the point he wanted to make about systems theory. You can have the best medical school and the best English or career in psychology or in education, but if they never talk to one another and integrate their systems, you don't have an institutional model of quality. One of the things in studying quality, as I have done, is that we have, in higher education, think of quality in terms of excellence, how selective our best students, our scholarship, publication of our faculty. But another definition of quality is the range of variability. If you bought a car from a manufacturer that had a range of variability that over 20% failed driving out of the showroom, but the other 80% were perfect and ran forever, that range wouldn't be successful. So every institution at any moment in time, this is true of Harvard, Stanford, Berkeley, some departments are excellent. Some careers are excellent and others are in very <laughs> transitional states or in very difficult with personnel changes, change in the discipline and the like. So institutional systems to assure the quality across the institution is equally important to having quality system for each career. Now across the world, um, and certainly in, um, in my work in Hong Kong and China and um, uh, the Emirates and other places, there are areas that are very common. Does each institution have clarity about who it's serving? What is its mission? Harvard has a very different mission from San Francisco State. They're both involved in education, but they have very different students. Integrity is very important. One of the things accreditation needs to assure that the representations that are made about a career, about success, about preparation for a changing workplace is in fact authentic and accurate. And we actually study uh, the representations, all the documentation, we meet with students, um, we do all kinds of things to make sure that there is institutional integrity. 
uh, and that the institution has sustainability and enough financial resources to stay in business. Uh, that's is even true in public universities, which in the United States have gone through serious budget cuts and have had to close departments, uh, shut down a number of courses and the like. So we look at all of these issues, research and scholarship. One of the big changes that has occurred, um, a wonderful scholar named Ernest Boyer developed the notion of the scholarship of teaching and learning. We assume that because somebody has a PhD, they know how to teach. Unfortunately, most doctoral programs don't prepare their faculty, they prepare their graduates to teach, particularly the new tradition, non-traditional students. So the idea of the scholarship of how to teach so that students can learn and learn in adaptive way is really important. And, and in many institutions, there are peer-reviewed journals, publications in those areas so that research is on learning, not just in areas outside the university. We also adopted a standard on contributing to the public good. Universities should exist to serve the public, to serve their students, and to contribute to the society. And we want to see how that works. Also in the United States, there's been a dramatic shift. There used to be, 25 years ago, 75% of all faculty were full-time tenure track, on a tenure track. That number is 37% today and going down. So tremendous use of part-time adjunct faculty. And we look at how those faculty are integrated to assure quality. So I've already mentioned that higher education is critical to national development. There's a shift toward the knowledge society from an inf uh, agricultural, industrial, to now a knowledge society. Uh, in the United States, the data suggests that by 10 years after graduation, the typical college graduate will have, had, will have worked for at least five different companies. Over 30 million jobs didn't exist in the previous quarter. The change is so great of the nature of jobs around technology, use of robotics, nanotechnology, and the like. We also have expanding institutional models, completely online, partially online universities. I don't know if you've heard of MOOCs. I'm sure you've had massive open online courses. Arizona State just entered into a program where uh, number one, all Starbucks employees in the United States get reduced tuition at Arizona State to complete their degrees. They also entered into a partnership with edX, which is a partnership of Harvard and Massachusetts Institute of Technology, to offer a first-year freshman program through MOOC courses. We'll see if that is successful. So one of the things we're seeing is that employers are demanding a whole new set of skill sets, teamwork, innovation, entrepreneurship. How well are we preparing students for that, regardless of the career? And of course, increasing internationalization in both directions, students going abroad to study, coming into different countries to study, and internationalization of programs uh, so that students are prepared to enter into careers that are increasingly international. We've worked very hard to redesign, work with the universities to redesign their educational curriculum to focus on learning outcomes. There is a presumption that faculty know what uh, chemistry or biology ought to be and it's just take these courses some of which are required, many of which are optional, and you will graduate and be a chemist, a biologist, or be prepared. Increasingly, more attention, more alignment needs to be developed and clarity about what do students know and what can they do with their knowledge. There is a wonderful film that came out about 15 years ago 
uh, called The Private Universe, in which it's at a Harvard graduation. And there was interviews of recent Harvard graduates in all fields and faculty, including in physics, astronomy, and other fields. Why do the seasons change? And even science graduates couldn't answer the question accurately. So they had completed the curriculum, but didn't know certain things. So they had studied cram for the exam. So the ability to say, what can you do? Can you apply the knowledge? And they actually then went back into middle school and high school and showed how this topic was taught and how people live in a private universe and don't change their thinking. So focusing on outcomes, not just I taught this subject, but here is a demonstration that students learned. It's not just completing an exam. And this is what employers are saying, at least in the United States and other countries I've seen, there needs to be greater adaptiveness, uh, ability to learn and relearn new knowledge in the workplace. So uh, focusing on outcomes enables to put attention on that. And that means a dramatic shift in the faculty role. They say that uh, a phrase for that is from sage on the stage to guide on the side. How do you help students learn rather than just lecture and assume it goes from my mouth into your head. Unfortunately, it goes in one ear, and 20 minutes later, research says out the other. So one of the things we did at WASC and other accrediting agencies have done has focused on this redesign. Uh, let me just say that in Europe, these, the European standards and guidelines for quality assurance agencies also has this emphasis on explicit learning outcomes and how you align the curriculum to achieve those outcomes to meet the needs of different kinds of students. And that curricular or that learning outcomes are built on not only the disciplinary expectations but feedback from employers and other organizations. So that, that is the standard to achieve for the registry for all of the quality assurance agencies in Europe. So there is a global or at least an emerging emphasis on learning outcomes, particularly given the very significant variation in student preparation. So we called it also a culture of learning within the institution that's supported by institutional accreditation of internal institution-wide systems of quality assurance, committees on assessment of student learning, on institutional research, uh, Calif uh, University of California, Berkeley, considered to be the best public university in the US, um, had a departmental award for the department, not just a single faculty member, but for the department that had demonstrated it was doing the most to improve student learning. And they do that every year. As I mentioned, uh, this has led to the development of significant institutional research and dissemination of data, but not just how selective we are, but about learning outcomes and how to develop learning outcomes. Uh, we also, at an institutional level, is look at programmatic and career accreditation and say, what have those agencies found and how do we bring that into the institution? And to create centers of learning within institutions. Uh, we set standards uh, in 2001, recently revised them. But one of our standards was creating learning organizations. And ironically, many universities are not learning organizations about themselves or student learning. They're about teaching, and they're about doing research about society and problems outside the university. So we put a lot of attention on creating learning processes about learning how effective are we in achieving the outcomes for our students. 
So that meant to identify learning outcomes at the program and course level, mapping courses, um, defining different ways, not just exams, uh, for assessing the learning outcomes and moving beyond grades and creating rubrics, capstone courses, all different approaches that are used differently by different careers and departments. And we require that every department not just go through an accrediting process but have an internal quality assurance process. So we develop forms working with our institutions and I just wanted to share several. Um, how do, what is a good learning outcome? How do you state it? There's something called Bloom's Taxonomy, uh, Fact Recall, um, Analysis, Synthesis, Moving to Higher Order Thinking. So you'll see in all of the forms we have initial, emerging, developed, and highly developed. And our peer review teams use these forms and we would not accredit an institution that was only at the initial stage, even emerging. We expected all institutions to be developed or highly developed. So first was to assist institutions in preparing what are well-stated outcomes. A curricular map is to say, given our outcomes, put on the left-hand side, where are they taught and what everywhere it, faculty found was that not all outcomes are taught in the curriculum nor done in a sequential way from initial to intermediate to advanced to build mastery in those outcomes. One key issue is many departments, many universities would have too many outcomes and it became very bureaucratic so it's to keep them focused and simple. Another thing we did was we created what we called an inventory of educational effectiveness and you'll see in the left hand column at the institutional level for general education which is required in all baccalaureate programs and for every degree program and for student services are there formal learning outcomes? Are they published in the catalog? so that students can know them, they're not hidden, that students know what are the outcomes expected, what evidence is used beyond grades, how is that evidence used, how are the findings implemented and followed up and resources allocated, and the date of the last program review, because as I said, every department has to go through a program review. Every university, Berkeley, UCLA, to the smallest institution would fill out this form and everyone has found it valuable including the elite research universities because they would find gaps and same with curricular mapping. In fact, if you go to the UCLA website, they took that form and made it better, uh, made it for themselves and they adapted. We and gave these to the institutions and said use it, adapt it in the way you would like. In order to move toward an institutional learning centered culture, we embraced the role that an accrediting agency should be more than a regulatory body but a collaborative educational body you can't ask an institution to meet standards that they don't know how to meet. So we offered workshops in areas of standards on how to do, use these forms. We created self-study or self-evaluation institutes. We published, all this is public on websites that we developed, re we had groups of uh, faculty and administrators from throughout the region develop resource guides on how to implement and these were all voluntary but gave suggestions and ideas. We even created a nine month certificate program for 35 students that was selective or 35 I should say faculty and staff in a nine month program called Assessment Leadership Academy, partly online, partly in person, 
to develop the skill to lead institutions toward learning centeredness and gave a certificate at the end. We developed online training modules. No person can serve on a peer review team without going through multiple stages of training. And we got groups of institutions together, cross-institutional, to share information about how they could use the accrediting process successfully rather than competitively. And then we identified uh, people with a lot of experience who could serve as consultants to assist. So let me just say that moving into institutional models first requires, there are stages that I've seen we went through uh, and that I've seen other agencies go through. Collaborative and iterative development of standards. We would revise our standards every seven to eight years after extensive and exhaustive research. We really evaluated where we applying our standards appropriately to the institutional mission, to the different kinds of students. So applying the standards adaptively without rigidity or uniformity. Our first round of reviews, and I've seen this elsewhere, are compliance. Do you meet the standards? But after that, Stanford would ask us, come on, do we need to, we didn't, they have a $32 billion endowment. Do we need to worry about finances? The truth is, their medical school's losing money, but other, they have plenty of money to cover it. But the answer would be, can we waive the application of some standards or find a quicker way to focus on the best institutions, on those things that will add the most value. And that creates a risk-based model that the institutions that are problematic will be reviewed every year, every few years, whereas those that have gone through reviews successfully will have a much simpler process and have a longer period of accreditation. As I said, we do extensive training, and we went through, every few years, we go through extensive evaluation of the, ex the effectiveness of the standards and the processes through surveys, data analysis, focus groups, and conceptual papers about where the future is taking us with these changes. So let me just say, that, so we have found the model to work tremendously well, but there are real challenges. Faculty identify with their disciplines and often not with the whole institution. And there has to be a way to then say, where does, why should we focus on other departments that aren't where we live? And that's to build a sense of the institution as a whole, not just one career, one program. There are significant costs. It's a full year to 18 month process to focus on the whole institution. Our research shows that um, the costs are over 100,000, could be $150,000 uh, at Stanford, given that everybody is well paid. Uh, they had a three year process. They claim it cost a million dollars and weren't too happy about it. But it is time consuming and therefore there has to be a way in which this process adds value, particularly after the first round of review. Uh, I've coined a phrase called accreditation fatigue. Uh, it's a long process. If you go through career accreditation, you've done a lot of work, then you're now going to tell me you want me to work on institutional accreditation. So you have to space things out, you have to work, give rewards, but um, make sure that the process doesn't divert people, uh, it adds value and doesn't divert people from the fundamental work of teaching and learning and research. So therefore it should build on existing processes, existing findings from career accreditation. We have found that doing pilot evaluations was critically important because we learned that we didn't have it right the first time we did it. We've made lots of revisions based on those pilots 
And in fact, we did two rounds of pilots. We just revised our standards before I left WASC. In 2013, a whole new set of standards with a new emphasis on student retention, student learning. And we did two rounds of pilots to make sure we were working effectively with institutions. Institutions don't like to be evaluated. Who are you to come in and avail tell us where we need to improve? Communication, collaboration, engagement, sharing of results is critically important to make this process work. Commendations are as important as areas in needed improvement. What are you doing well you should continue is important to validate as what are you not doing well and need to improve. There need to be different kinds of institutional actions. So it's not just yes, you're accredited or no, you're not. In, in the US, there is something called, uh, first of all, there's the first stage, a preliminary stage is candidacy. Not yet accredited, but you have a four year period to demonstrate being accredited. And for institutions, if accreditation is not compulsory, candidacy is a very good way to work with institutions, to develop them and to see if they can meet the standards for accreditation because some institutions aren't ready yet. And just in the WASC region alone, well, we had, uh, as I was leaving, 20 institutions seeking new or initial accreditation. So as new institutions were coming online, some were well established, some were international institutions seeking WAS accreditation, some were accredited by other bodies, but they needed to meet our standards. We also gave different time frames, seven to 10 years between reviews with a midterm report and annual report. So there was annual monitoring, but some institutions don't need to be visited or reviewed right away, whereas others you worry about, you're back in as much as possible. So that's the risk-based model where you think there are real problems, there needs to be heightened attention. So in conclusion, let me just say that I think the greatest value of a institutional accreditation is it refocuses attention from a single program to the whole institution, not just parts, and it helps build systems across the university like a good, well-running car that works well, sustainable, and is going to provide a narrow range of variability of quality rather than just focusing on those that have programmatic or career accreditation. And ultimately, it can lead to new conversations and new communities within the institution when you work together. And it has its costs and its challenges that you need to be sensitive to. So I would just say that they should be seen together, career and institutional, that the institution meets performance standard continuous improvement is promoted, student mobility, that degrees and credits are going to be recognized, going to be recognized by other institutions, by employers, and most importantly, putting the student at the center, that the student in every program has had a good quality experience, and that quality and integrity is reported to the public. We were the only accrediting agency in the United States to put all of our reports and all of our actions public on our website. And I think that's critically important for the public to see what are the standards that universities are being held to. Uh, that, I'm not sure if that's being done here with Sinais. So that's uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias a don Ralph. Quiero pedirle por favor a don Bernardo González Arrechiga, a don Álvaro Cedeño y a don José Andrés que suban acá al escenario. <coughs> 